Hello, everybody. My name is Paul Lynn. If you're here, you probably already know who I am. Regardless, I'm a big old PLC programming instructor from plcdojo.com. And for those of you who want to learn how to program PLCs all by yourself, sitting at the house, nobody telling you what to do, nobody looking over your shoulder, don't have to spend thousands and thousands of dollars on classes and things, I'm here to help. So I'm going to give you 10 steps that you're going to need to teach yourself how to program PLC at home on the couch. Okay, step one, you are going to need some software, all right? That being said, if you're uh, one of those Mac guys, you got apples on all of your stuff and you say, oh, I want to be an Apple PLC programmer. Something you need to know is that in the automation world, almost nobody makes Mac apps. So you're either going to need to buy an actual computer, i.e. a machine that runs Windows natively, or you're going to need to create a VM and run that on your Mac or boot camp Windows, something like that. But you will need a Windows environment to be a PLC programmer. Now, once you've got that operating system squared away and you're running Windows, now you're gonna need some actual PLC software. And you're probably already thinking, hey, you know what, I wanna be a Siemens programmer. Or where I work, they use Alan Bradley, so that's what I need to learn. It's great that you already have a sense of direction of where you wanna go, but I wanna put a couple of ideas in your head before you start running off in one direction or the other. One, all of your PLCs out there use the same five languages. So if you learn how to program one brand of PLCs, you've pretty much learned how to program all the brands of PLCs. So when it comes to learning what environment you use, not quite as critical as you probably think it is at this stage of the game, okay? so. The brand of software that you use is not indicative of the brand that you're going to end up programming. And on top of that, like most PLC programmers, you're probably going to want to earn money from all different brands. I mean, are you really like, you know, so brand exclusive that, oh no, I don't want Allen Bradley money. I don't want Delta money. I only want Siemens money. <laughs> I mean, come on, you'll go broke. So. You know, be open to the idea that a PLC programmer can program any PLC you put in front of him, and he likes to get money from doing all of that work, okay? So your future is programming everything under the sun, so don't be too set on one brand and everything has to be that brand, okay? Here are some things that I do want you to really care about when you're figuring out what software you're going to learn on. One, some of that software is damn expensive, okay? And I don't want you out there spending $3,000 for a software license so you can learn how to program PLCs. I mean, for all you know, you might get into it a little bit, start doing this and say, dude, what the hell? I hate this shit. I don't want to program PLCs. This sucks. Uh, I, I want to go home and you know write, write country music. Whatever, man. Um, Hey, don't spend $3,000 to find out. There is plenty of free PLC programming software out there. That's what you want to learn on. So one, that software needs to be free. Now, when I say free, I mean free for you. If your company already bought you a license or you already have some software that, you know, is licensed and it's professional and whatever, hey, stick with it, you know. I just don't want you spending money out of your own wallet. It's not necessary. Second thing I want for that software is, remember I mentioned there are five PLC programming languages. I want you using software that can program all five of those languages. And right now you're thinking, damn, that sounds a little bit intimidating guy. You know, I just want to learn how to make a PLC, you know, jump and do what I want it to do. Don't make me learn five damn languages. Trust me, not as bad as it sounds. You're really going to focus on learning one. And once you know that one, the other four are going to be like automatic practically. But anyway, you need to learn all of them because, again, you don't want to be walking away from, you know, a table full of money on it because, oh, I never took an extra week to learn the other four PLC programming languages. I can only do one language. Oh, you know, that's stupid, right? So... Yeah, you're gonna want software that can do all five languages. Third thing, 
is I want you to find software that will simulate or emulate whatever language uh, that actual software uses. I want you to find software that can execute the programs you create so that you can watch them run and make sure that everything's working the way that you expect it to work. Think about it. You're sitting here reading your book on PLCs or whatever and you're learning all these different instructions and then you go over here to your software and you put all these instructions together and you think, hey, I'm PLC programming now, baby. Only problem is, you know, an actual PLC programmer walks over, looks at your program, scratches his head and says, hey, uh, this sucks. This isn't going to work. This would break a machine. You couldn't even load this. A real PLC wouldn't even execute this. This is, this is trash. This is just some symbols thrown around on some lines. You got nothing here. And he's going to walk away and you're going to be like, but dude, I spent like a month on that. Don't, don't worry about that you're going to get some software that can simulate. You're going to test what you do. You're going to make sure everything works the way you plan. You're going to be prepared for that. So get some software. I'm not going to tell you what software to get. Um, remember, you're doing this on your own. I'm just kind of guiding you. But you want software that isn't going to cost you anything, that supports all five of the PLC programming languages, and that can simulate and execute your program. Now that you have your software and it's installed on your Windows environment and you're like ready to go, remember we're talking about these five languages, right? Right now I want you to put four of those out of your head. I want you to focus on ladder diagrams or ladder logic, whatever it's called in that software. And a lot of you right now are thinking, oh no, man, I heard all the cool kids use function blocks or, oh, but they told me instruction lists execute really fast and I'm all about performance and that's what I, I don't care what you heard. I, I don't care what the cool kids are doing. Uh, ladder logic is the most prominently used and widespread PLC programming language out there. Some PLCs only support ladder logic. And no matter what you want to ultimately do, and you're going to be one of the cool kids that uses, you know, some other language, regardless, you're going to want to get money working on programs that use ladder logic because not every job you're ever going to have is going to be someone coming up to you saying, hey, create me a program from scratch. You're going to have a bunch of people coming up to you and saying, hey, um, we need you to work on this program, modify it, make it bigger and better. And the guy wrote it using ladder logic and some other language. You're going to want to be the one that says, hey, whatever you got, I can do it, baby. Lay it on me and just go ahead and deposit that money in my bank account. So you're going to be focused on ladder logic. And while you're in ladder logic, what are you going to be doing? You're going to open that environment and there are some instructions. You're going to see a ton of instructions and you're going to be like, where do I begin? You know, some of these uh, environments have hundreds of different instructions. Don't worry about all of those. Once you learn all the basics and you know how to use those, you can expand and grow into those other more exotic instructions and conditions as you need. And now that you have a basis of knowing how things work and how things flow, trust me, it's going to be easy when you get to that point. But where do I want you to start? First of all, Let's start talking about numbers, okay? Uh, you need to learn how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Those are your mathematical operators. So get in there and figure out how to do that. Where are those instructions that you can feed it a one and feed it a three and get a four out, right? Add, subtract, multiply, and divide. If you've got those four things, uh, your math is pretty much covered because pretty much anything else you're ever going to do is probably just going to be a, an assortment of those. There might also be a compute block which you can put in a whole big equation and it'll spit out the answer, but look for that. It might be in your environment, it might not. Next thing I want you to look for is your comparators. Uh, you've got two numbers here and I want to know is this less than the other one? less than or equal to the other one, greater than the other one, greater than or equal to the other one, equal to the other one, or simply not equal to the other one. Uh, 
Okay. You know, all of those, the little alligator with the big mouth and you know, he's either greater than or less than, right? Figure out how to do that in the program. In any programming language in the world, you're going to have comparators. And in any program you ever write, you're going to have to compare values. So that's one of the first things you need to figure out and figure out how to use. Um, from there, we're not straying too far from math. Uh, I want you to look for timers and counters. Okay. Really, what does a timer do? It times something. It counts time. Uh, and when you're talking about process control, you know, there are a lot of things that need to happen for X number of seconds or Y number of minutes or Z number of hours. Therefore, the timer instruction and in your environment, there might be multiple timers, but at least learn how to use one. Chances are, if you know how to use one, the rest of them are going to be pretty intuitive at that point. And counters, you know, the same concept as timers. Timers count time, counters count events. You're going to want to know how many times certain things happen. Uh, many processes, you know, have to iterate 20 times before it goes to the next step. So a counter is your friend. Find the counters. Again, there may be multiple counters in this environment, but at least find the basic common one that just adds one to a certain value every time something happens and write that into your notebook. Okay. So you got those math operators, you got those comparators, you got your timers and counters from there. Let's look and see if we can find, and this is a little bit trickier when you're talking about digital logic bits, things that are either zero or one, right? We need a way to evaluate those because those are going to play a big, heavy part of PLC programming. We want to be able to test bits and say, is this energized or de-energized? Is this high or low? Is it one or is it zero? And you're going to have uh, different, uh, you're going to have different conditions which examine those bits and say, you know, yes, it's good or no, it's not good. In Allen Bradley, those are called XIC and XIO. Examine if closed and examine if open. They'll be called other things in other environments, but they're some of the very most basic in, uh, conditions that you're going to find in PLC programming. So you've got to find those instructions. Usually they're going to look like an open pair of contacts, like you would see on an electrical diagram or for the examine if closed, they'll look like a pair of uh, contacts with a, a slash drawn through them. Find those. And while you're finding those, you're also going to find an instruction that looks like a coil in most environments. And that's going to be to energy a bit or to set a bit high or to set it to one. So you need to know how to control bits and evaluate bits while you're programming. A whole lot of this game comes down to yeses and nos. So that's important. Um, one other thing that you can look for, it might be in your environment, it might not. And that is a scaling instruction. So whenever we're working with an analog signal coming into our PLC, you know, we've got an instrument that's out there reading temperature or pressure or something like that. And it's sending us an electrical signal like negative 10 to positive 10 or zero to 10 volts or four to 20 milliamps, whatever inside of our program, we don't program with electricity. It's not how programming works. We program with numbers. So we need an instruction that will translate uh, whatever information we're getting from our input module. That input module is going to take that electrical signal and turn it into some arbitrary range of numbers like zero to 16,383 or, you know, 2000 to, or, or sorry, 4,000 to 20,000 or some, you know, other random range of numbers that's completely meaningless to you and me. So what we need to do is if we've got a signal coming in from zero to 16,383, well, that's actually attached to a sensor that's measuring from zero to five PSI of pressure. So we've got a number coming in that might be 11,000 and we need to convert that and, and do a linear transform to see what that 
relates to when we're talking about a scale of zero to five. In Alan Bradley, that's called scale with parameters. In, uh, I don't know what it's called in other uh, environments, and in some environments there is no such command. You really just have to put in the math in some kind of computation block or process that will you know, translate one range of values into another range of values. So if that's in there, find it. If it's not, oh well, you'll have to do it mathematically and you know, do it the long way. But start with those instructions, find those, read the reference manuals, see how they work, see what kind of data types they require going in and coming out and things like that. Get familiar with those basic instructions once you've got those, that's going to handle most of everything you ever do in a PLC program. And as you need those more exotic uh, instructions and conditions, uh, by the time you have these uh, under control and you know how to use them, the rest of those things will be real quick and easy to pick up. Step three, you have gotten your software, you've uh, got it installed, that's great, you're dying to use it, but you didn't know what to do with it, so I sent you to the books and I said, learn all these different instructions, and you picked them up, hopefully you jotted them down somewhere, and you're like, what do I, when do I get to start playing with them? If you haven't already, now figure out how to use your IDE. Um, your integrated development environment, your PLC programming software, whatever you want to call it. Now, let's start getting our hands dirty with it. So, go in there and start by doing some really simple stuff. The goal here is to experiment with all those instructions you learned in the last step and figure out how they work, figure out how they don't work, figure out how to make them do what you expect and want them to do. So, if you have an add block and you want to add one plus one and get two out of that, can you go into a ladder logic program, use an add block, feed it a couple of ones and get a two out of it? You know, now's the time to find out and figure out how to do that. And also, obviously, you're going to have to learn how to simulate within your environment to make this stuff actually happen. Just creating the program doesn't make an ad block work. You have to execute that program in a simulation or on a physical device to actually get it to crunch those numbers and spit you out an output. So now's the time. Figure out how to use the software you've got. Figure out how those instructions work. If you get stuck, it is entirely possible that you can like click on an instruction and hit F1 on your keyboard and a lot of, in a lot of environments a help menu will pop up. Otherwise, you might have to go to good old Google and run a search and say, hey, yeah, how does the ad instruction work in this environment or whatever? Chat GPT can tell you, hey, there's a lot of ways that you can find that. There are YouTube videos that show how all these instructions work, but Anyway, figure it out and do that with all of these different instructions you learned in the last step. So, you know, create a little calculator app and if I push a button, this mathematical operation happens and it happens after so every so many seconds, so I'm using a timer. And then I have a counter that counts how many times this has happened. So get in there and throw all of these instructions into the program, figure out a way to work them all in there until you've got something that is completely random and useless and doesn't do anything but use all of your instructions. And once you kind of have a feel for how to use those instructions and make them work the way you want, you're done with this step. You're ready to move on to some more advanced stuff. Step four, let's dial it up a little bit and get a little bit more technical. You are going to have to do some research on this part and it's not going to be super easy, but you're doing this on your own and you know this is a, a part of it. Now that you've got some instructions that you know how to use, I want you to go and look for some actual circuits that you would use to create a real live PLC program for an actual system. 
Okay, so when you think about it, you're thinking, well, if I want to program a system, I'm going to drop one instruction at a time and turn it into a great big program. It's kind of true and kind of not. Uh, it would be better to say you're going to drop entire circuits in over and over at, and use these same standardized circuits repeatedly to create a full PLC program. So what are these circuits and how do they work? Well, one, think about this. Uh, have you ever heard of HOA controls? HOA stands for Hand Off Auto. And what that is, is it's a control scheme for devices on a system. So for instance, I've got this big cool machine and I've automated it with my PLC and it controls a bunch of pumps and motors and conveyor belts and heaters and who knows what else, right? Well, here I've got this conveyor belt, right? And normally it's going to be in auto mode because I want the PLC to start it when it's supposed to run and stop it when it needs to be stopped. I want the PLC to control it. That's the spirit of automation, folks. That's what we're in this to do. But sometimes, you know, there's problems with this conveyor belt or we're not using it or it needs to just be temporarily disabled. So I want this thing in off mode. I don't want it to run under any circumstances, even if uh, everything else in the system is running. I want this conveyor belt down, okay? That's my off mode. So I've got off and auto. What the hell is hand? Hand means it's hand operated or in our terms, it's manually controlled. So if it's in hand mode, then I can basically push the button and make it go, let go of the button and make it stop. Or I push the button and it starts going until I push the button again and it stops. There are different ways to implement hand mode, but regardless, we want a way that this thing can be turned off, forced on, or under automatic control of the PLC. There's a logical circuit that you use to create that kind of control scheme in a PLC program, and you need to figure out what that is and how it works, okay? On top of that, how about alarms? Sometimes on a system, on a, a machine, things break, and sometimes processes get out of control. Sometimes the level runs too low in your tank. Sometimes the temperature goes too high in your heater. And whenever bad things happen, you need to create alarms that are going to protect the system. They're going to interrupt processes. They're going to inhibit devices so that they don't come on. They're going to sound alarms and bells and whistles and flashlights to notify the operator that, hey, something's broken over here, right? So how do you create those alarms? How do you manage those logically in a system? How do you implement delay timers and notification bits and alarm bits and all these different components? That's a circuit you're going to have to learn. Um, the next big circuit that I want you to learn and we'll freeze it here, that circuit is going to be digital control logic. That is, the absolute most fundamental and most important circuit you will ever learn in PLC programming. And what that is, is, you know, you've got your system controlling some device that's either on or it's off. Well, how do you turn it on? How do you keep it on? And how do you turn it off? Easy. And within your program, Remember, we're going to be using these little bits to control a lot of things, to set modes, to set statuses, to set alarms. A lot of your PLC program is going to be controlled by bits. They're either one or they're zero. How do you set a bit to one, keep it set to one, and then um, drop it back to zero when you're done with it? You're going to need a circuit that has a trigger, uh, which is a signal that starts this bit and energizes it initially, but does not keep it energized. It just triggers it. Then you're going to need a hold-in circuit. Once the bit gets energized, this is a circuit that keeps it perpetually energized. 
And then the third thing you're going to need is an interrupt. You're going to need a third signal in there that once this thing is self-sustaining and held in, that when this signal is received, it's going to break that cycle and disable your bit again. And when I say bit, that could just as easily be that digital device that we're controlling external to the PLC. But whatever the case, you're going to need digital control logic. You're going to need to know how to program alarms. You're going to need how to, uh, to know how to program HOAs. Are there other circuits you will need? Absolutely. But if you've got those three for now, you're in a real good place. You can do a lot of damage with just those three circuits. Okay, step five. Next thing that you need to work on is creating some actual programs for real systems. When I say real systems, I don't mean like actual machines that are on a factory floor somewhere or something like that. What I mean is, you know, so far you've just been doing little experiments and figuring out how to add your numbers and how to create these different circuits, and that's all fine and good. But from here, now branch out and imagine in your mind, do a thought experiment and come up with some systems that only maybe exist in your head, but then create the PLC program that's going to control them from top to bottom. Classical examples include things like controlling an intersection of a street. You've got all the different lights, red, yellow, and green. You've got the crosswalk buttons, the signs that say walk and don't walk. You maybe have the weight sensors under the road that tell uh, the, the processor when there's a car waiting at the intersection to go. Uh, you've got timers. You, you've got, you know, actually a whole lot going on in a simple intersection. And create a PLC program that will control a th an imaginary intersection. Another classical example, an elevator. It's a simple enough device. It just goes up and down, taking people to different floors of a building. But when you think about it, it's deceptively complex because, you know, you've got that elevator moving up and then somebody hits a button and calls the elevator. When should it go to that floor? What if, you know, someone pushes, it's on its way up to eight, someone on five pushes the button and then 30 seconds later, somebody on 10 pushes the button. Where does it go after it's finished with eight? Does it go down to five or does it go up to 10, right? You've got to think about all these things. Is, is there a weight sensor in that elevator that, you know, protects it against uh, an excess of weight, which would create an unsafe condition because too many fat people got into the elevator? Whatever the case, think about that. That's actually a pretty heavy program to create. You can do it. You can also imagine other systems. I don't know, a snow cone machine or a baggage transport system in an airport. Just imagine any system in the world and, you know, sit there and think, what inputs should the operator be able to send? They want to turn it on, turn it off, start it, stop it. What happens if there's a problem? Is there a fault mode? Is there an alarm on a warning system? What all needs to go into this system and just kind of make Maybe create it, you know, on a notepad or something and just, you know, imagine to yourself how it should work. And once you've kind of filled in some of those details, get into your IDE and create the PLC program for it. One, that's an excellent way to learn PLC programming. Two, now you're creating something that you can walk into a job interview and show off, okay? Because you're walking into that interview, you know, and you're like, well, I got no experience. I never done anything before. Uh, I taught myself PLC programming at the house, but I'm not real good at it yet. So what do you think? Will you give me thousands of dollars and let me, you know, figure out what I'm doing at your office? And they're like, uh, Probably not, especially not if they've got somebody experienced willing to do the job. But when you walk in and you say, hey, yeah, I don't have experience and it's true. I've never done this job before, but let me show you where I'm at and you can tell me. 
and you whip out your laptop and you show them a full-on system that you've designed and how it works and you simulate it and explain it and walk them through the logic, okay, you might not have experience, but at least now you do have some tangible results that they can see and touch and put their hands on and then buy. You know, they can say, yes, okay, this guy knows a thing or two. It's still a little rough, but it won't take us long to get this person up to speed. You know what? Yeah, guy, you're hired. Okay. So start working on creating programs for full, complete systems, at least a couple. Step six, you're probably dreading this one and you're gonna hate me for saying it, but once you actually get into it, I think you're gonna realize, you know what? This isn't as bad as I thought, not at all. Remember all those other four PLC programming languages that up till now we haven't touched? Now's the moment, baby. Get in and learn those other four languages one at a time. So now that you've got a, a, a couple of full systems programmed, now figure out how to create that whole program again in each one of these other four languages, at least in the ones that can create an entire uh, program like that. But go through and figure them out. Um, you're going to be very surprised to learn this even though all of those languages look very different on your screen, you're going to realize that, wow, all of the logic, all of the circuits, all of the instructions that I've already learned, they're exactly the same in these other languages. They just look a little different on the screen. It's going to be a really cool revelation because whereas it, it took you maybe, you know, a couple of weeks to a month to get up to speed in your first language, you can probably pick up the other four in the next week or two. And then you know all five of the PLC programming languages. And even better, again, I like this point because I'm money-minded. You can go into that job interview and you can not just show, well, here's one thing I did in one programming language. Please give me a job. Instead, you can say, hey, I don't care what programming language you guys have been using because I taught myself all five of them and I'm ready to rock. All right. When you can show them that, not just tell them that, not just write that on a resume, but when you can walk in with your laptop and demonstrate that for them, I tell you what, that goes a long way towards getting you paid. Now, step seven. Step seven is a little bit more of a research project and you're gonna hear it and say, ah, maybe I don't need to do that. But it will make you a lot better programmer and very fast if you do this. It'll also be a little intimidating at times, but it, this is going to be something that if you do this, you will never come back and regret it. If you don't do this, there will probably come a day that you'll be like, man, I wish I had done that. I want you to find a couple of PLC programs for actual real systems that were created by other PLC programmers. Who cares who they are, where they are, what kind of machines they are. The, the, the more outside of your experience level, the better. Find some real PLC programs and reverse engineer them. Open them up see what makes them tick, follow the logic, trace everything out, try to figure out what the hell was going through this other programmer's mind that made them do things the way that they did. And sometimes you're going to be like, whoa, that's, a, that's real damn smart. I'm, I wish I had thought of that myself. I'm going to steal that. I'm going to start doing things that way because that's better than what I've been doing before. Yay, you just got smarter. And also, you're going to find a bunch of stuff that you're going to look at and say, what the hell is this happy horse shit? This is junk. This is garbage. This guy's all over the place. Whoever wrote this was drunk, you know? Um, trust me, once you get out in the field, once you start working with other people's logic, and that, that's an inevitability, it will happen, you're going to find some of both. You're going to find some just 
beautiful, elegant Rembrandt of PLC programming kind of logic that just makes you stand there in awe and bask in the glory of how magnificent it is. And you're also going to find some stuff that, you know, it's, you're just looking at this like, what the hell do you want me to do with this? This is crap. And, you know, you want me to work on this? Dude, I need to just recreate this whole thing from scratch. This, Look at this. This is garbage. This is useless. I, I'm surprised any part of this even works. You'll see both. But that's something that if you can get that experience now, that's going to prepare you for a whole lot of reality whenever you're actually out there on the job. So take the time find some programs. It's not easy, you know, these aren't like just floating around out there waiting for you to pick them off of a tree, but do what you can to find some PLC programs and reverse engineer them and do your best. You might not even be able to figure out all of the logic that's going into some of these things because, you know, sometimes, I mean, there's just some crazy stuff going on under the hood, but give it a shot, work on it for a little bit. It will make you a better programmer. Step eight on this journey is a whole world unto its own. And this is not PLC programming per se, but it goes hand in hand with PLC programming so much so that I would say 95 to 99% of the work you ever do with a PLC is going to involve an HMI as well. Human machine interface. If you do not know how to create an HMI and connect an HMI to a PLC and get them talking back and forth and exchanging information, you are going to be left out in the cold when they're handing out the big paychecks. Okay? It's just a fact of life. PLC and HMI go together like peanut butter and apples. You wouldn't even dream of eating an apple without peanut butter on it. Same thing. The idea of a PLC without an HMI is just absurd. Okay? It, it almost never happens. That being the case, there are a lot of different HMI softwares out there. Some of them are free. Some of them are ridiculously expensive. And very few of them will talk to you know, different brands of PLC and things like that. It's complicated. What's even worse about HMI is even though the concept is very simple, once you learn how to create one type of HMI, when you go to the next one, the interfaces are usually so different that it's not just as quick and easy as, oh, well, I know the concepts, I'll just jump in and do it. Usually it's such a struggle to figure out where everything's hidden in the different environment that it can really be tedious moving from one HMI to another. But stop and think about this. It's, it, this sounds like I'm giving you a big old thing to chew on here, but not really. HMI isn't bad. All of your logic, all of your actual mechanics, all your decisions are being made in the PLC. All your timers and, and you know, it, well, if this is this way and if that's that way, then do this. All of that happens in the PLC. So what is the HMI? It's really just showing the operator what's happening inside the PLC and allowing the operator to send some inputs into the PLC. That's it. So you've got displays and you have inputs. Show me if this bit is high or low. Here's an indicator. Show me what the value is of this uh, piece of data in your PLC program. It's 50 right now, you know, just a little display that shows that number. And well, that's pretty easy. And here's a button. If you push this button, that bit inside of the PLC program will momentarily be energized and then it'll de-energize when you let go of the button. And here's a number entry field. You type in a number here and hit the button and then that number will be sent into the PLC and stored in some register. 
that's pretty much what the HMI does. So, you know, you're really dropping a bunch of shapes and line art and creating graphics and using different indicators and displays and buttons and text entry forms. Maybe you have multiple pages and you navigate between them. But really, all the hard stuff, the logic, the math, that all happens in the PLC. So, comparatively speaking, the HMI is much, much less complex of a thing to create. Uh, it's really the easiest part, even if it takes a lot of time. So, um, also, I want you to think about job interviews. I talk about job interviews a lot because I like money and I want you to get a lot of money. Um, when you walk in and show your PLC program, they say, oh great, you know some stuff. When you walk in and you show your PLC program and your HMI and they can see it all and interact with it and go back and forth and see how your brain works and how you lay things out and even interact with it all while it's running, man, it's going to be real hard that you don't get a job interview after a pony show like that. I mean, you're going to pretty much have to set the person's office on fire on your way out the door for them not to throw some money at you, okay? So definitely learn HMI. Um, a, a PLC programmer that can't do HMI, that's about as useful as a Ferrari with no tires, okay? I mean, it's got a big engine and it's pretty, but you can't drive the damn thing, so what's the point, you know? Really? Take your time, learn that HMI. Step nine is not a technical engineering kind of thing. So right away when you see the title of this, you're gonna be like, oh God, no, I don't wanna do that. That's not what I'm here for. Neglect this and you will pay for it for the rest of your life. And if you have a family, they will pay for it for the rest of your life too. You have some new skills, you have some new talent, you need to learn how to market yourself and sell your skills. What's the point of being a PLC genius and knowing all of this stuff if you can't convince somebody to give you money? If you can't convince somebody to invite you into the door of their office. You need to take the time to learn how to sell. There's a lot that goes into that. Job interviews, how do you dress? How do you walk? How do you talk? What kind of things do you talk about? Do you crack a joke once in a while? Are you allowed to smile? Can, can you give someone a compliment on a job interview? Do you just walk in there, sit in the chair like this, wide-eyed and frozen and nervous, with, holding out your resume? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, sir. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. I'm not going to hire that. Would you pay for that? I don't care what this person knows about PLC programming. If they can't have a conversation with me, if I don't meet this person and think, damn, you know, that sounds, seems like someone I'd like to hang out with once in a while. That's a cool dude. Uh, if, if you're not somebody that can instill in me the confidence that by hiring you, my life and my job are going to be easier and better, I'm not going to pay you. I don't care what your resume says. I don't care what you talk about. I don't care even what you've got on your laptop. If, if you're sending me signals that make me think, hey, you're going to be in my office causing drama. You're going to be in the middle of every controversy. You're going to be you know, involved in office politics and you're going to be whining and you're going to want, you know, another job and you're going to be floating away, you know, a couple of weeks after I hire you. If I'm getting all any of these signals, I'm sorry, you're not coming over. So learn how to sell yourself in an interview. Learn how to negotiate salary. Learn how to actually get paid and have a good career check my YouTube channel. If you do, you're going to see, hey, 
This guy has a whole series of career videos that talk about everything from the marketing end of it to independent contracting to finding work opportunities. It's all there and it's all free. And I made it all for PLC programmers. So if you've got a better place to learn this stuff from, oh, by all means, go there and tell me about it too. But this is made for you, okay? Definitely check out those videos. It's going to put money in your pocket for the rest of your life, okay? Take it serious. Don't skimp on this. Learn how to be successful as a PLC programmer. Last step, step 10. This is my favorite step of all, okay? This is the part where you go out there and you get a real job and you get paid to keep learning, okay? There are those people that are like, perpetual students, okay? I'm a lifelong learner, all right? I'm proud of that fact. I'm always studying, like almost every day, if not every day. I'm always learning, and I'm retired, and hell, I'm still studying. But that being said, don't let the fact that you're still learning paralyze your career, okay? You, if you've done the steps in this uh, video, you know enough, you've got enough experience, you can do some damage. You deserve to get paid for programming PLCs. I know what you're thinking, man, but I'm still learning. I need to be learning for years and years and years before I could ever approach somebody and ask them for work with a straight face. Smack, you deserve that if that's what you're thinking right now. No, go out there, get paid. You're still learning, yes, but you're getting paid at the same time. Learn and get paid. Things are coming into here, you're getting smart. Things are going into your wallet, you're getting rich. It's perfect, okay? You know enough to be useful to a company right now. So get out there, get up off the chair, get up off the desk, stop making excuses, stop being afraid, go out there, get yourself some money. All right, get a job, get a project, get a side hustle doing PLC programming. What, whatever the case, now you should be getting paid. Okay, that's it. That's my 10 step program to making yourself into a PLC programmer. That's what I've got. Those 10 steps were not easy steps. And if at this point you're thinking, man, I think I might have bit off more than I can chew teaching myself to program PLC, don't worry, baby, I got you. Go to my website, plcdojo.com, plcdojo.com. You're gonna find all five of my PLC programming courses. You're going to find other PLC programming courses that are also excellent or they would not be on my website. And you're going to be able to learn from those courses about 20 times what we've discussed here. So on your own, this is going to get your foot in the door. This is going to get you off to a running start, what we've talked about in this video. But if you want something a little bit more formal, you're still at home, you're still learning at your own speed, but you've got some guidance from someone who loves you and wants you to be successful and is going to you know, take a little bit more time and teach you all these things step by step, um, go to plcdojo.com. I have got you covered. And when you look, you're gonna say, man, these are like the cheapest PLC courses I've ever seen. You know what, they can't be any good. And then you're gonna read all the reviews and you're gonna run a couple of Google searches and you're gonna check on Reddit and you're gonna say, well, holy hell, everybody's saying these things are like the best PLC courses there are. Um, that's because they're right. I've got students in over 180 countries. I've been doing this for years. I've taught over 80,000 people how to program PLCs. And in all that time, there has not been one single solitary person come back to me and say, Paul, I took all your courses 
and I still don't understand. I couldn't follow. I didn't know enough whenever I started and you lost me. I, I, I did all your courses. I got on the job and then they said I wasn't prepared and I didn't know enough. Uh, -uh that didn't happen. My courses it doesn't matter what you know, what you don't know, what experience you have or lack. If you speak and understand English, you will be able to follow along with my courses. That's a fact. And if you go through my courses, you will be prepared to have a nice career as a PLC programmer. That is also a fact. So if you want to go it on your own, I've given you 10 steps. You know what you're doing. If you decide you want a little help, pick me, pick me. One of the best there ever was. Um, also, if you haven't noticed, I got some pretty useful content going on my YouTube and there's new stuff coming out regularly. So subscribe, not the worst thing you could do. Continual education, keep getting better, keep getting more money in that pocket. That's it. Thanks for watching. I appreciate you. I'm out. Cheers.